Hi, everybody. I'm Josh Earl. And I'm Will Garcia. And together we're the Hoops Guys. And we're continuing our 2014-2015 NBA season previews today by talking about the Utah Jazz. So, Will, uh, was the Jazz uh, music playing well in Utah last year, or was it somewhat of an ear sore? Um, the jazz music might not have been playing, but I think there might have been some Michael Jackson going on because they were bad. Uh, finishing yeah. 25 and 57, Tyrone Corbin did not have this team playing well. No. Uh, and, and that was reflected in their offense as not a lot went well for them last year offensively. But there were a few things that went well, or at least decently well. Uh, they, they got shots in the paint where they were tied for eighth at in the paint true shot attempts, and mm-hmm. they converted well at the rim, finishing tied for tenth in restricted area field goal percentage. Yeah, uh, not much good on defense either, other than them limiting three point shooting. They finished eighth in corner three shot attempts against them, and tied for seventh in restricting above the break three point shots attempt, or restricting above the break three pointers against them. Yeah, uh, this team this uh, team did not have a very good year, so it was more about how well their young players developed, yep. and their draft pick Trey Burke didn't really have a good rookie year by any stretch, but his presence on the court was definitely felt by the Jazz. Prior to his return from injury against the Pelicans on November 20th, the Jazz mm-hmm. started 1-11, so that's an 8.3% winning rate. After his return, they finished the season 24-46 and 46 for a winning rate of 34.3%. Um, I, I think a lot of that just had to do with Trey providing a stabilizing element as an offensive conductor for the team, and I think that really helped them uh, get everybody else in somewhat better roles and just kind of calm things down a little offensively. Yeah, Trey Burke is, um, despite, like you mentioned, a bit of a rough year, he is a very skilled facilitator um, because before then they were starting Alec Burks at the point guard, who also had a good year, yeah. um, but you know that's not really his role. Having said that, as mentioned, Alec Burks did show a lot of improvement in his third season, putting up career highs in points per game and per 36, assists per game and per 36, and improving his scoring efficiency by a pretty hefty amount, going from a little bit below average at 51 to a little bit above average at 55 in true shooting percentage. Um, It's not like we mentioned him playing the point isn't his typical role, but he did about as good of a job as anyone could expect when Trey Burke was down. And he did a decent job considering the circumstances, I think. So yeah. all of that culminated into a nice, fat, juicy, four-year, $42 million contract extension. Yeah. Uh, speaking of extensions and fat ones at that, uh, Derek Favors started his fat extension <laughs> and uh, showed improvement. He helped fill the hole that was left by the loss of Big Al Jefferson and Paul Millsap in free agency. He put up a a line of 13, 9, and 1.5 blocks on pretty solid efficiency, about 56% true shooting percentage. Uh, He's not a great shooter still. Uh, Shot 26% from mid-range from 16 feet to three-point line. But his value as a rim protector, a defensive rebounder, and a dive man in the pick and roll make him a very valuable piece of this Jazz team. Absolutely. Um, However, there still was a lot of bad stuff that happened. In fact, I'm going to have to bring the Michael Jackson glove back out because, again, there was a lot of bad, especially on offense. With the team finishing 25th in offensive rating, 23rd in effective field goal percentage, 22nd in XPPS, and 23rd in actual points per shot. And again, XPPS and actual points per shot. Link to that in the description it's from Ian Levy's Nylon Calculus stuff. It's awesome. Check it out. But a lot of that was because this team just couldn't make shots, finishing bottom 10 and above the break threes, shots in the paint, mid-range field goal percentage, and free throw percentage. And then on defense, they were bad everywhere. 
Yeah, I'm going to just rapid fire succession hit you with a bunch of bad numbers. So the Jazz were 29th in defensive rating, 29th in actual points per shot defensively, 26th in defensive effective field goal percentage, uh, bottom 10 in restricted area true shot attempts defensively, in in the paint true shot attempts defensively, in mid-range shot attempts defensively, and in uh, corner threes. They gave those up at, in uh, such a way that they finished dead last in corner three field goal percentage defensively. Mm-hmm. And on top of that, they were 29th in forcing turnovers and 21st in terms of limiting opponents from getting to the free throw line. Yeah. That's a lot of bad. That was pretty putrid. Uh, But having said that, being terrible on defense and pretty bad on offense, it did come with the fourth pick in the draft in what many people consider to be one of the best draft classes in a while. Yes, and with that fourth pick, the Jazz took uh, the R. Austin Powers International (laughs) Man of Mystery of the Draft Mm -hmm. in Australia's Dante Exum. Um, Dante Exum's kind of like a swing for the fences type pick by Dennis Lindsay. And like a lot of the times when you swing for the fences, your chance at both glory and disaster are at their highest. Mm -hmm. To me, his game's a lot like a zoetrope in that he shows tantalizing flashes of skills that make his game almost spring to seeming life in front of your eyes. But in reality, it's just your brain tricking you. (laughs) Um, He does have potential. A lot of potential, but he's really raw. So it'll take some time before the Jazz really know for sure if they belted a homer or if they struck out with that fourth pick. Yeah, I was a bigger fan of their later second round pick or later first round pick, Rodney Hood. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rodney Hood isn't a great off the bounce guy, but he has value right away with his perimeter shooting, especially considering that he shot 42% from downtown and a really good Duke team as a sophomore. He was also a pretty good defender when he was engaged, uh, which is the case for a lot of young guys. But he has decent shot selection, and I think that'll help him fit really well on a team with other scoring options. Mm -hmm. Another uh, big guy that they added, Trevor Booker. Uh, Strong finisher in the paint, solid rebounder, good defense. That's about what you can expect from him. Uh, a guy who isn't really much of a finisher in the paint, more of a finisher from everywhere that isn't the paint. His name is Steve Novak, and he's a huge threat as a catch-and-shoot guy. Can just spit hot fire Dialon from that three-point yep. line. Pure dialogue style. Um, had very successful runs in New York and led Toronto in three-point percentage last year. I think he should provide similar production for the Jazz this year. Yeah. Just as a really, really good three-point shooter. Speaking of a player who spent some time with New York, uh, Torrey Murray is another Mm -hmm. player brought in by the Jazz this offseason. He had a pretty solid rookie year with the Knicks. He shot 41.7% from three, which was pretty impressive for a rookie guard. Um, He he might get some backup minutes at the point this year. Mm -hmm. But he'll probably mostly be the the third point guard. Um, One player that's going to get no minutes for the Jazz this year. Especially at point guard. Yes, especially at point guard, but played a lot of minutes last year for them was Marvin Williams. Uh, Mm -hmm. Former number two overall pick, wound up kind of being forced into the stretch four role for the Jazz last year. And... It, it was an attempt to introduce some spacing mm-hmm. for that team, but he only shot 35.9% from three, so roughly average. Uh, yeah. it, it helped, but it, it, it's not something that they're particularly going to be devastated that he's no longer providing that for them. Yeah, a guy who, when he's on his game, can do a lot better than 35.9% from three is one of my favorite players, Brandon Rush. He's a, When he's healthy, he, there have been some health concerns, he is an elite 3 and D guy. I, I, I think he's an elite 3 and D guy. I 
think he's a high quality three and D guy. Okay, um, but he only played in thirty eight games for the Jazz last year. Kind of a ramen noodle all star guy when healthy. healthy. Yep. Um, another guy, another wing that they lost this year, Richard Jefferson. He's playing out in Dallas now. Uh, Richard Jefferson started for this Jazz team and was a really solid veteran presence, but this is not the same guy from New Jersey. No. Um, he isn't going to be that high flyer, dunk contest, take off, do these crazy windmills and tamahawks and stuff. He's more of a, a spacing element kind of a guy who can really stroke it as a spot-up shooter. Yep. Um, and he can also play some defense. Yep. As a veteran presence, I think that's where they're going to really miss him the most, yeah. though. Uh, of, of course, Brandon Rush and Richard Jefferson came to the Jazz through a, a trade with the Golden State Warriors, where the Jazz mm-hmm. used the flexibility afforded from the free agent departures of Paul Millsap and Big Al Jefferson to take on some hefty salaries from the Warriors in exchange for some extra picks. Another guy that came over in that deal on a big contract, along with Richard Jefferson and Brandon Rush, was Andres Biedrins. Mm-hmm. And the, the biggest thing I can say about Biedrins is that the Biedrins free throw watch ended last year with an over on the over under of five taken per season. <laughs> so he, he's always kind of had a problem from the free throw line. And... It continued, and that's about the only thing of note I could really say about him last year. Remember um, when he was good? Huh? Remember when he was really good? Yeah. For the Warriors? Yeah. Yeah. One player who was was kind of decent for the Jazz last year, but wasn't really super good, was mm-hmm. uh, Deontay Garrett. He, he wound up uh, shooting 37.5% from three, and, and that was kind of the, the highlight of, of his production for the Jazz. But he, he was a decent uh, backup point guard who got thrust into perhaps too big a role when Trey Burke started the season out on the pitch, yeah. or on the IR more accurately. Mm-hmm. Speaking of the IR, one thing that helps prevent trips mm-hmm. to the injured reserve list is rest yes. and at the hoops guys we have a thing we like to call rest differential mm-hmm. and it's basically just taking a look at how many get uh, four games in five nights three games in four nights and road back to backs a team plays over the course of the season compared to their opponents and the jazz have a rest differential of 23 which is really good yeah, uh, it, it basically just means that over the course of the season, they're going to be much more well rested than their opponents. And you throw in the added elevation element of their home mm-hmm. court advantage, and that should help net them an extra game or two over the course of the season. Absolutely. Um, something we like to do here is called five questions. We ask five questions to each other to touch base on some stuff we otherwise wouldn't have been able to get to. And something that should get the Jazz more than one or two games is the improvement from Tyrone Corbin to Quinn Snyder. Yes. How big of the improvement at head coach do you think it is, though? I don't know if it's, like, the biggest in the league, but it's definitely going to be a big improvement. As Mm -hmm. we noted, the Jazz were pretty woeful both offensively and defensively last year, and that's kind of been the case under Tyrone Corbin. And Quinn Snyder, at the very least, is going to introduce a few more elements of interesting into that jazz uh, offense and defensive systems. And we already have seen in the preseason them running a lot uh, more off-ball and uh, ball-movement-heavy offensive sets, as well as uh, some intriguing stuff with uh, Biggs, spacing the floor which we'll touch in a sec on um and defensively that they're already playing a little bit better it'll take a little while longer to get that going but uh so far quinn seems to be doing pretty well at least in terms of making the team a little more interesting and making it a little easier for them at least on the offensive end right now so Absolutely. I think he can have, with the core that's in place here, with 
a, a, a strong enough offensive system, which but there seem to be hints that that might occur this year, and even some improvement on defense, he's going to help them win a couple extra games than they would have otherwise, I think. Absolutely, and he's definitely the coach for the all hair team. Yes, and he's definitely the coach of your nightmares if you're afraid of William Defoe and you've seen that gif of yeah. him with the, like, <laughs> I can't even do it. But it's, like, the creepiest, snarl-looking face I, I've seen a head coach in the NBA give. Yeah, that will make a guy make sure he runs the players correctly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So there's that. Um, exactly. Speaking of him kind of being able to get his players to do what he wants with his scary William Defoe-esque face, um, <laughs> so far in this preseason and already in the regular season games that have taken place by the time uh, this airs, uh, he's already kind of having some interesting stuff go on in terms of his bigs, Trevor Booker and Ennis Cantor, launching threes. I like it. Yeah. Is this a good idea? I think so. Um, here's what we know, okay? We know that a three-pointer is worth one and a half times as much as a long two, uh -huh. because a long two is two, you know, math. Yeah, yeah. We got that. Um, <laughs> plus, we also know that gravity comes not necessarily based on being a lockdown shooter or a knockdown shooter, although that helps, but it's also based on how many attempts that you generate. So if you can get a little bit more spacing by pushing a guy like Cantor out a couple feet, even if it hits his percentage takes a little bit of a hit, the extra spacing that you get, plus the extra value of the three-point shot, I think it all cancels out pretty well. And if you have two bigs going out, like let's say you're playing Oklahoma City, right? And they have Kendrick Perkins and Serge Ibaka. Both of those guys, in different ways, kind of function as rim deterrence or, in the case of Ibaka, an elite rim protector. If you can force both of those guys out of that paint, that opens things up for guys like Gordon Hayward and Burks and, and Trey Burke. So I think that there's a lot of value, especially in having two guys who can do that, as well as just the inherent value. If, if you already have a face of big, why not push him back? Yeah. Uh, speaking of their bigs, do you think that Rudy Gobert could be one of our defensive linchpin types? Yeah, so Gobert is kind of uh, being buzzed about after his show in uh, the World Cup this year. Mm -hmm. And so far in preseason, he, he's, he's been doing really well on it's the real boards. Deal. I think it's possible for him to become a defensive linchpin. Like most young players, he still has to get the nuances of team defense down a little bit more solidly before you can mm -hmm. really kind of trust him to uh, kind of run the defense for you, right. calling out the coverages and where guys need to be and making sure that the passing lanes are, are closed when they're supposed to be closed and, mm -hmm. and you know, just overall – organizing the chaos that is the, the defense in the NBA. I, yeah. I think he can do that. And there's some intriguing things that suggest at the very minimum, he's going to be one hell of a rim deterrent. Mm -hmm. So in his rookie year, when he was only 21, he posted a defensive rebound rate greater than 25% and a block rate greater than 7%, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. I, I checked, and since uh, the 78-79 season when blocks first started getting tallied, uh, he's the only player in NBA history to have posted those numbers while averaging at least 10 minutes a game in a season in which they were 21 years or younger. Yeah. And he has a freakishly huge wingspan. Oh, he's crazy long. He's reasonably athletic and mobile. Mm -hmm. So I think that, absolutely, if he can get the team defensive concepts down, and for a 20, what, 22 right now, yeah. year old dude, he's right where you want him for yep. that sort of growth. Exactly. And considering he might develop into a piece as valuable as a defensive linchpin, what does that mean for Ennis Cantor? 
especially when you factor in that Ennis Cantor is uh, going to be coming up a, soon for a new contract. Mm-hmm. And the Jazz recently put high value contracts in the books on Gordon Hayward, Derek mm-hmm. Favors, Alec, Alec Burks. Burks. Yeah. Um, does this mean that the Jazz might wind up looking to move Cantor? I wouldn't be surprised if there were some trade rumors going around. Um, I think that could go either way. Obviously, a trade is so hard to orchestrate. Um, that's why I, you see him so rarely. Yeah. Um, but I think especially if he can reliably shoot threes at a decent clip, that's going to push some teams over the edge and really help his value out a lot. Mm-hmm. Although if I he don't... can approach average, league average from three, I think his stock would be pretty high. I, I agree with that. And a couple of attempts per game, like one and a half or so. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be really... I think he'd be a pretty valuable piece. I think a lot of teams would be looking at him. I just don't know where he would really go. But there will be a market for a big dude who can shoot threes and get decent box score numbers. Yeah, and can rebound and has shown a, a, an ability to score in the post. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is this core good enough for... To return the Jazz to their formerly guaranteed spots in the playoffs? I think with the right pieces around them, there's a lot of promise here with uh, Trey Burke, Alec Burks, Gordon Hayward, Derek Favors, Cantor, Gobert, Rodney Hood, and um, Dante Exum. I think it's possible in the next three years that they're in the playoffs. But this is the Western Conference we're talking about, and mm-hmm. it's going to be the really Western tough. The Western Conference. So we're still going to need to see some de- internal development from these players and, and see them reach a higher level for them to really consistently be a legitimate uh, threat to, to consistently make the playoffs every year like the Jazz used to be. Yep. Uh, one thing that we are consistently doing are 20, 50, 80 predictions. And what that essentially is, it's a prediction that we think is 20%, 50%, and 80% likely to happen. Josh, take it away, man. So I think it's 20% likely that Gobert gets some extra minutes this year and thus winds up continuing his block and defensive rebound uh, rates at a, at a similar level and thus puts up some pretty impressive numbers in those regards, and that leads to him getting some most improved player votes. I'm not suggesting he'll get get a lot, but I think he'll get some. I agree with that. Yep. Uh, I think it's 50% likely that this Jazz team improves their record by at least 10 games this year. Yep. Agreed. Yep. That would obviously be a major improvement but in the west they would still mean pretty bad uh i think it's 80 percent likely that dante exum winds up a a very quick fan favorite in utah in large part due to the hope that's being kind of pinned to his shoulders Mm -hmm. the zoetrope effect i mentioned earlier and just him being kind of a genuinely really cool seeming dude yeah plus his name yeah Dante Exum. Yeah. Plus, he's got that Australian accent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, cool name, cool accent, cool dude, fourth overall pick, a couple of sports center highlights, and everyone will be all over him. Yep. Uh, I think that's – go ahead. I was just going to say, speaking of all over him, (laughs) Will is going to be all over his predictions. Okay. I think that's 20% likely that the Jazz finish at 500. Which is a little bit of an extension of your 50%. Mm-hmm. But I think it could happen. Like it's we possible, mentioned, there, yeah. there's a good little core here. Improve coaching. If people stay healthy, hey, it could. It wouldn't be enough to make the playoffs, but it'd be a decent looking team. Yeah. Uh, speaking of team, I think that Dante Exum has a 50% chance of making the all rookie first team. Just because a lot of rookies, even some of the higher ones, aren't might not be getting that many minutes. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, because all rookie teams aren't based on position. So Nerlens Noel's a shoe in. Wiggins is probably a shoe in. Jabari. Um, Jabari is a definite shoe in. Uh, from there, who else? Alfred Payton's definitely going to Alfred Payton's going to make it. So there's that fifth sort of spot where you have guys like McDermott, Nick Stauskas. Um, Adrian Payne, have, if he gets some playing time for Atlanta, could do that too. I hope he does, but I don't think so. So there are there's that fifth spot that's still up for grabs. I think that Dante Exum, if he keeps getting the minutes he's been getting, has a decent shot of getting it. Fair enough. Then I think that it's 80% likely that Trey Burke... Trey Burke takes on a larger scoring role and improves his efficiency. Just because that rookie year struggled, he was a much better player than that in college. So much adaptation has to go on to prepare for the NBA. And pretty much no rookies ever come in super efficient Mm -hmm. unless they have been there for like four years and they're usually in a specialized non-ball dominant role. Yeah, and and not to mention Snyder's already started to introduce, like I mentioned, more off-ball movement. Yep. Which helps get the defense moving before the ball actually reaches the player that's going to initiate the main action. So he should be facing less uh, kind of zeroed in defenses next year. And the ball movement should help him catch uh, more opportunities against closeout defenders and off balance defenders trying to get back to him than he faced last year. Yep. So at the end of the day, the big question is, is this team going to be good? I think they could be entertaining and Mm -hmm. perhaps a league pass worthy option. And they're definitely going to be better than last year, but they won't be that good. I agree with that. I think they'll be better. And I wouldn't even call them a bad team. No, I wouldn't say they're bad. Yeah, I just don't think they'll be good. But hopefully you thought this team preview was good. So if you liked it, please leave a thumbs up. If you didn't like it, thumbs down. Uh, If you feel either way about it or your thoughts can't be summed up into a simple thumb motion, maybe leave a little comment down below or maybe leave a comment to talk about this Jazz team. If you like this preview, hit the subscribe button and you'll be notified of all of our future team previews and other videos we have going on. Uh, Josh, do you have anything else to say? Thanks for watching, and I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Agreed on both of those. Peace out, guys.